you're lucky you even heard me. But uh, Art, he's a character, man. He, um, he had to ask all kinds of questions. So what was, life, what was life like for me when I was growing up? Well, um, let me kind of give you a, an idea. The first rocket I built, I was 12 years old, the one that I launched, the very first one. The engine is a liquid-filled uh, type rocket. It has little cryogenic pumps in it uh, where we're pumping a fluid 400 below zero. Okay, can you imagine handling that stuff? So you might heard on our belt, well, how, how did you have such access to things? Well, my dad worked for a guy named Lee Petty, and he has a son named Richard. I don't know if you ever heard of these guys. No? Well, yes, Winston Cup, about 100 times. Uh, they're the most famous race car drivers on earth, and um, they work, they drive these stock cars. And my dad worked for them about 20 years. So well, they had state-of-the-art high-performance machine shops, bigger than this. And if you knock all the walls out in this building, it's twice the size of this building. So huge machine shops, and these machine shops are built for one thing, what? Speed. So I'm looking at all this, and I'm 12 years old. My dad's having me overhauling 426 Chrysler Hemis. I could overhaul one of them things in three and a half hours. Talk to a garage next time. Well, this guy can do them in three hours. It'll be three weeks, buddy, before we can get your car back. So I was, we could do everything fast, but I could really do these engines. With two four barrels on these uh, engines, they turn 675 horsepower. Pretty big engine. And I'm 12 years old, and I'm learning to do that. And the honer weighs more than I do to get them in blocks. That's how can you end up something like that. So anyhow, uh, during the day, I'd work on these things, and everybody goes home, and what do I have laying there as far as the eye can see? All of these presses and lathes and machines, which I now know how to run. Also, the fuels in this building. They have things called fuely, drag racers. We have methane, nitro, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. We have kerosene. We got gasoline. I mean, man, you know, basement farmer dream. I can do anything in here. So, uh... The petties let me work in there, and they said, what do you do, Dave? Don't blow up the place, okay? So I built my first rocket, and I, I took it home, and it was about this tall. And I set it up in the backyard, and my little friends come over. We're all 12-year-old kids stand there. Now, most of us aren't even allowed to play with matches. <laughs> okay, I don't need a match, believe me. So... Um, all my, all my friends have never seen me launch anything. They hear me talk about it and stuff. I said, I'm going to build this thing. So they're standing there, and they're looking for a 4th of July rocket. You know, you know pew, pew, that's it. Uh-uh. Um, I backed everybody up, and we backed up about the length of a football field. And they're going, you're kidding. You know, I said, you know, they, they stand this far when they light a little bottle rocket and watch it go. I said, I don't think you guys want to be standing that close when this thing goes. So they kind of know I'm strange anyhow. So they, they get behind trees and stuff like that. And I like this thing. And I do it remote control, wireless, just poof. When I hit a detonation, it goes off. It leaves the backyard, y'all, 3,500 miles an hour. <laughs> Burns a hole the size of this room in the yard. <laughs> Down to the roots. Thank you. I turned around and looked at my friends, right? <laughs> Nothing but dust and little particles in the air like a cartoon. It's boom. My mother comes running out of the house. This thing you can hear four miles away. It is, she runs out there and she looks at the yard just incinerate smoking. So she sees this white thing going straight to the sky and she just goes... And... I'm standing there looking at her, and I go. <laughs> so my mom looks back at me, and she goes, where's your friends? And I went, somewhere in the next county by now. I didn't see them for a week. They said I was going to be, they told me I was going to be beaten to next week. But um, anyhow, that thing's still huffing and puffing. It, uh, the altimeter I had hooked onto it, 120,000 feet. That's, a, that's ionosphere, folks. That's the last band of layer of atmosphere on the planet. It's about to go space out of my backyard. So um, 
I had a time where I could come back in, delay charge. I was counting the uh, seconds like that, and then the wind shift and drift, and finally comes back into sight. Parachutes come out, and the thing just starting to drift down, and I walk about from here at the back door and just catch it, you know. And I had to let go of it real quick. It was so hot. But um, so while I'm standing there, we're watching it float back down to me, and I asked my mom. I said, um, "God, I am so weird. There's, you know, I'm not like everybody else. You know, what is this?" And she looks at me and she goes, well, I'll tell you something. You came, you didn't come from me. You came through me. <laughs> it wasn't until 30-some years later with the metaphysic crowd that I figured out what my mom was trying to tell me. <laughs> so, and then I was really worried. So, um, that was the first time we built a rocket. So you ask, well, how do you know how high up it went? It's real simple. You take a protractor. You ever seen them things, a little half-moon thing? You glue it to a board, you take a stick this long, screw it into the board, put two little eyelets on it, look through it like a rifle, and follow the rocket. You measure 500 feet from the pad to cosine, and trigonometry and table is cosine 1. Multiply that by, the, uh, by 1 times 500, and then you get the reading off the protractor. Figure that into the calculation, do your second clocks, and guess what? Altitude and speed you have in your hand. Now, the reason I make that point it cost me $5.30 to make all this. NASA had the same thing at $12 million. And we both get the same accuracy. So, talk about overkill. <laughs> On what? That's it. Well, you got to pay all these guys when you have five people sharpening pencils, you know, at $40 an hour. So anyhow, that was the beginning of everything, and um, the rocket uh, took off. Well, my mom and dad figured, you know, it's time. My, <laughs> my dad was practical, although he was, um, I was born in West Virginia. I was born in number 10 Pocahontas coal fields. Uh, I'm about 15th generation coal miner son. Glad to be a coal miner son. Anyway, so anyhow, um, my dad was a functional letter. He never, he only went to fifth grade, but boy, he could build engines. So he, he also was a very clear thinking person. You know, first thing he did after he came home, he saw the yard. <laughs> and then he walked over to me and said, I guess you don't want to mow grass too much, do you? <laughs> and he asked me, he's very quick to the point, where did you assemble and prep this thing? And I went, uh, in the basement. He goes, uh-huh. Uh, so, first thing Dad did, he didn't, we got up early next morning and everything was moved out of the basement <laughs> to about 500 yards away to this big old service station we used to have, and he set a huge machine shop up in there for me so I could use. So, he told my mother, he said, well, Vanjie, if he blows up this time, he won't launch the house with us in it. <laughs> the building will disintegrate, we'll just put a big stone over there. This is David, our son, who used to be here. So... My dad was pretty cool, but uh, now I had a big machine shop, and I mean, it had a full bathroom in it and a little bed area, and I, I lived there. did not live with my parents. I lived in this place, and I'm 12 years old. I'm odd, y'all. So uh, I started building these rockets, and the rockets got bigger, bigger, and faster. And I was all the time calling FAA for flight tables. You know why I'm doing that? I don't want to go punching a hole in the belly of an Easterner, you know, airliner going over. So at the time where everybody's at in the sky and go, boom, she takes things up to it. And FAA people going, what is this weird blip on the screen? <laughs> Nothing moves 4,500 miles an hour now, you know. <laughs> some kind, and at, at that time, in the early, late 60s, UFO flap, like some kind of UFO, look at that, <laughs> boom. But, um, and it was, Irregular. Hell yeah, the irregular. I was shooting in between the airliners. So, anyhow, things were happy until something happened. Um, I wasn't satisfied with these engines anymore. Got to build something bigger now. So, right about when I'm about 13, I come up with this idea of building a new type of engine. It's called a fusion magnetic containment engine. Now, people, most people really go, oh, that's nice. Well, let me get you, give you some appreciation, okay? Imagine if I said, 
let's take a hydrogen warhead, like a hundred megaton, that if it went off right here in this room with us, you won't have to worry about it. But, um, <laughs> but people about two miles away, it'll blow a hole two miles in diameter and a thousand feet deep. It'll raise the temperature to about 100 million degrees centigrade. Now we're gonna take all that force and power and we're now going to put it inside, appropriately, we're gonna put it inside a bottle and contain it. <laughs> right, sure. <laughs> so that's exactly what this engine does. Now how can it, po this sounds stupid, it can't possibly be true. And that's, that's 3D rocket scientists, people tell me that. I'm like, oh yeah? Well check this out. There's only one thing that we know of that can bend light and space and time out in space, and only one thing we know of that can swallow a sun that disappears, and that's called a black hole. And thanks to a little guy named Stephen Hawkins, we were able to come up with quantum mechanics, in which he now proved that these theories are now fact. Well, I was, but you got to know something. You know what year this is? 1967. It will be 20 some years, 22 years before you hear the term quantum mechanics. At age seven, I was working quantum mechanics, doing it all with the math and papers. So um, I'm working on the mathematics of this thing, and it gets a little strange because I can't figure out some of the theorems on this thing. I can't build an algorithm model. So let me give you appreciation of environment, okay? There are no faxes, no sailors, no pagers, no beepers, no power books, no personal computers, no CD-ROMs, no cable television, no microwave ovens, and it'll be another 10 years before Texas Instrument builds the first handheld calculator. All I have is pencil and paper and chalkboards and a thing called a slide ruler. Anybody remember those? <laughs> I see some hands. Well, anyway, um, which, by the way, I went at a yard sale. Do you remember the giant yellow one that was in the classroom that could pull that thing around? I found one for five bucks. I got that thing hanging over my shop. And they go, what is that? Well, I know how old you are now. <laughs> so, especially when girls ask me that, watch out, I'll get you. So, I'm working on this stuff, and I can't do the calculations. It's just too taxing. It's too far out. Uh, for the algorithms to hold the model to contain this field. Because what I want to do is build an artificial black hole. I can do that with dual cyclotrons. And I came up with a particle accelerator where when the feeding system of the plasma drives, I don't want to go into it too detailed, but what that does is it creates an electromagnetic force field containment area that is the same intensity of a black hole. What do the black holes do? They swallow suns and they disappear and you never see them again. Obviously, you have a containment vessel for that power. Works pretty good, only if you can get the loop to close, and I couldn't. So my science teacher, could you imagine having me for a kid for a science class? <laughs> I'm in seventh grade at the time. He um, looks at this work and goes, what is this? And um, I said, I'm working on my math on this rocket. Well, see, they dropped me out of algebra because I couldn't do it. <laughs> and so he's looking at this. He goes, you want to work some of this for me? I said, sure, look at this. And he's going, geez. So um, can I borrow this for a minute? So he borrowed it and he went to Ohio State University. I'm in Mount Vernon, Ohio at this 